Thank you, Marcel. Um, it's fantastic to know that we have climate realists spreading the word effectively in the Netherlands, Clintel, Marcel's group. Here in the UK, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, Harry Wilkinson's group, who spoke yesterday and will be spe speaking again today. As well as in Germany, the European Institute for Climate and Energy, Holger Thuss and Wolfgang Mueller. Um, we will be, Hartland will be at their climate change event next week in Gera, Germany, where they have a conference uh, that's going to be similar to ours, but presenting the uh, climate realism truths on the European continent. Now, we've talked about science quite a bit yesterday and today, and really I want to ask a question. I want to challenge you. Challenge you if you're not sure where you are on, on the climate change debate. Challenge you if you think that there's a climate crisis, and heck, even challenge you if you believe that we're not facing a climate crisis. And the challenge is this. Who do you trust? For what reason do you believe in a climate crisis? For what le reason don't you believe in a climate crisis? Or are you in the middle? Why is that? And the reason why I want to present this challenge is because the scientific method tells us, let's, let's look at evidence and data. That leads us to truth. Not propaganda, not storylines, not everybody knows or I heard this. Now, in Las Vegas last month at our 14th International Conference on Climate Change, I presented a presentation dubbed Debunking the Murderer's Row of Climate Change Alarmist Myths. And in that presentation, I presented, first of all, the climate activist and media narrative about these high-profile climate scares, but then the actual science. So whether the topic was hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, floods, the Great Barrier Reef, ocean currents speeding up or slowing down. You saw what the media had to say, what the climate left had to say, but then you saw what the facts are. Now I'd like to start with another debunking, climate debunking of murderers row number two here in Glasgow. And again, take what the media says and then compare it to what the objective data says. And if you determine if you realize that the facts over and over and over again debunk what you're told in the media and by climate activists, realize that this is their modus operandi across the board. This is what they do. If you find that they're lying to you on this issue and that issue and that issue, don't take them at their word for things for which you don't have the evidence presented in front of you. By the way, send me an email. I'll give you the evidence on whatever topic that they present. But let's start with a few more of these pernicious climate myths that we hear in the media. Now, we are here in the first few days of November. That means Thanksgiving is coming up soon in the United States. And that means we're going to be inundated again and again and again with all sorts of climate alarms regarding Thanksgiving. That's what climate activists in the media do. They find something that people care about, that they love, that might be on their minds, and then they try to tell you that, that, that global warming is destroying it. So here you're looking at, this is a screenshot from the Washington Post. Uh, this is from November of last year. The title is, How Climate Change is Complicating a Thanksgiving Staple. The subtitle, Heat Waves, Drought, Lack of Winter Ice, are taking a toll on a quintessential Massachusetts crop. So the week before Thanksgiving, the Washington Post tells us cranberry sauce, a staple of Thanksgiving, everyone loves it, it's being threatened by global warming. Well, let's take a look at some facts. Here we have, this is a screenshot from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's page. This was in August of 2020, so just a couple months before we saw the Washington Post article raising alarm about cranberries being destroyed and threatened by climate change. What does it say? The USDA reports that Massachusetts cranberry farmers, keep in mind that the Washington Post story was specifically focused on Massachusetts, Massachusetts cranberry far farmers were expecting a record cranberry crop for 2020. Record crop production. And the Washington Post and the media tell us that global warming's destroying cranberries. This is what they do. They know the truth, but they lie anyway because they want you to believe in a crisis that does not exist. Now, if you follow cranberry production in the United States, you know that Wisconsin is actually the largest producer of cranberries. So, giving the Washington Post the benefit of the doubt and saying, well, maybe even if Massachusetts cranberry production is increasing dramatically, Perhaps in setting records, perhaps in Wisconsin, something different's happening. 
But no, it's not. Here we have a summary of August 20th, 2020 of Wisconsin cranberry production. Again, noting that Wisconsin leads the nation in cranberry production. But then the Wisconsin State Farmer reports that going back to 2020, the cranberry industry petitioned the federal government to take steps because there were so many cranberries being produced. There was a glut of cranberries. Prices went down. They couldn't make money anymore. In this era of modestly warming temperatures, cranberry production not only is setting records, it's setting so many records, production so high, that farmers can't get paid much for them. If you want to say there's a global warming crisis, you can say that global warming makes it so easy to grow cranberries that maybe it's not profitable anymore. But don't tell the American people you can't get cranberries anymore because global warming's destroying production. It's simply a lie. Now, just to confirm that Massachusetts and, and Wisconsin, the two leading cranberry states, what's happening there is happening across the nation. This is a website uh, from Statista. This is showing, or excuse me, this is from National Geographic. National Geographic showing U.S. cranberry production from the year 2000 to the year 2018. What you see is that cranberry production for the nation as a whole has increased by approximately 50% in just two decades. And it's not just one year or two years at the end that skew the trend. No, the trend is consistent. It is dramatic. So when the media tell you that we're facing a global warming cranberry crisis, they are lying through their teeth. And again, I want to show this slide because this shows the Washington Post article. The date was November 18th, 2020. They had access to this. They had access to this. They had access to this. And if the Washington Post is going to tell us that we have a crisis that's threatening cranberry production, they had all the data to know otherwise. You have to assume they did know otherwise and are deliberately lying. And it's going to happen again this year. In fact, it's already happened to some degree. Here's an article from August 25th of this year, Yale Climate Communications. The headline of their article, Climate Change is Hurting Cranberry Harvest in Massachusetts. A quote from the article, Climate Change Makes Holding, climate change makes holding On Increasingly Hard. <laughs> holding on. They're just holding on in the face of this climate crisis. More extreme heat in summer, warmer winters with less ice, and wild fluctuations between heavy rain and drought are taking a toll on cranberry plants here. Yes, they are. They're taking a, whole, a toll in the sense that they are more productive than ever before. That was in August. Expect much more of it later this month. But now you know the truth, and now you know who's credible and who isn't. After Thanksgiving, we will be in Christmas season. And Kamala Harris and the Biden administration are already blaming global warming for anything that goes wrong regarding Christmas. In fact, in this case, because we have the backup of the, of the delivery supply chain off the Pacific coast, rather than admitting that their own policies are contributing to this, the lack of labor availability that is in large part due to the supply chain backup, Kamala Harris is blaming global warming. Here is a quote from Kamala Harris at a press conference in Singapore in August of this year. This is what Kamala said, quote, The stories that we are now hearing about the caution, that if you want to have Christmas toys for your children, it might now be the time to start buying them, because the delay may be many, many months. And of course, the climate crisis is fueling a lot of this says Harris. When we look at the stronger typhoons that have disrupted shipping lanes and sea level rise, which threatens port infrastructure as an example. So these are the many issues that are causing these disruptions. So according to Kamala Harris, we have hundreds of ships sitting offshore in California waiting to unload their cargo. They can't do it because tor tornadoes, typhoons, excuse me, not tornadoes, typhoons have blocked the shipping lanes and are causing havoc this year. And sea level rise, I guess, is inundating ports, although we haven't seen any reports of that in the media. But let's take a look at some of the facts here. Okay, on the left, you see this is a chart produced by climate scientist Ryan Maui. This is taken from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration data. The data is regarding global tropical cyclone accumulated energy. In other words, this is the total energy produced by hurricanes and tropical storms around the world. On the far right of that chart is you see 2021. Do you see this massive increase in tornado, or excuse me, I keep saying tornadoes, hurricane activity, typhoons in the Pacific Ocean? Do you see this mass increase that Kamala Harris blames on the backup, the backlog of ships off the West Coast? No. You see that actually this year has been a lower than average year for hurricanes. 
If you look also on the right, I've pulled some information. The first one is from Wikipedia. Not always the best and most accurate source of information, but in this case, it is spot on. According to the Wikipedia page, the 2021 Pacific hurricane season, quote, September, so right after Kamala Harris made her statement, September was the least active month of the season since 2010, with only, it's only one named storm. Okay, 2010, global, or excuse me, Pacific Ocean hurricane and tropical storm activity, the lowest in more than a decade. Also from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, this is a quote from their website, that there's been, quote, an average Eastern Pacific hurricane season has 15 named storms, eight hurricanes, and four major hurricanes. But they report this year, there've been 17 named storms, so about the same as normal, eight hurricanes, exactly the same as normal, but only two major hurricanes, half as many as one would expect. By any measure, at worst, this has been an average Pacific Ocean hurricane season. And really, it's been a quieter or less devastating than normal because the major hurricanes are the ones that are problematic. Moreover, Kamala Harris blames sea level rise. Okay, well, this year there has been less than one-tenth of one inch of sea level rise compared to last year when Donald Trump was president and we didn't have this backup on the west coast of shipping. Less than one-tenth of one inch of sea level rise has not devastated port structure infrastructure on the west coast. What we have is this. Global warming is to politicians what the dog ate my homework is to fifth graders. When you've screwed up and you're facing the consequences for your own lack of competence, blame global warming. Just, just make it up and blame it. The media will carry water for you. People will believe it because everyone knows it, but the facts tell a different story. So when the Biden administration continues to blame global warming for the fact that your Christmas packages aren't being delivered on time, no, it's hogwash. You knew it was hogwash anyway, but here's the data. All right, next up, as I mentioned, the media likes to just identify what people love and then claim that global warming is threatening it. So people will say, oh my goodness, it's really affecting me. Coffee is one of those topics that the media present and climate activists present all the time. Global warming is destroying your coffee. You need to act now, we need to act now if you like your morning Joe. So here's an article from Time Magazine. The title is, your morning cup of coffee is in danger. Can the industry adapt in time? My goodness, global warming is destroying coffee crops. Can they adapt and save the ability to give you your coffee beans? Well, let's take a look at the actual facts. This is from the website Statista. This is, produce, this is representing coffee production globally. Coffee production worldwide from the 2003-2004 season through the 2019-2020 season. Look at this. What we see once again is nearly a 50% increase in coffee production globally during the past 15 to 20 years. Those are the hard facts. The media and climate activists tell you over and over and over and over again, because I see these articles myself all the time. Every week there's some alarm about global warming's destroying coffee beans and coffee production. Know the truth. Who do you trust? You trust the data, and the data is with climate realists, not the media activists. Maple syrup. We're getting to the winter season, so people are going to have more pancakes and hot maple syrup. So again, this is something that the media always claim. Year after year, they claim that global warming's destroying maple syrup. Here is an article from CNBC. The title is, Hotter Winters, Darker Syrup. Maple farmers fear climate change will upend New York's industry. Well, let's take a look at the actual data. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, again, folks, I'm presenting authoritative, objective sources. I'm not presenting someone's estimates, guesstimates, or interpretation. I'm giving you the actual data from the credible sources, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So I found on their website that a 2018 publication, and they listed the amount of syrup yields per tap by year. 2015, you see that New York maple syrup farmers, producers, were able to get 260 gallons per tap. In 2016, 281. In 2017, 287. Every year, maple syrup production and not just because there's more people out there producing, therefore you get some more. No, production per tree, yields per tree. If global warming is so devastating to maple syrup production, why is it that yields per tap are increasing? I then found the 2020 publication from USDA. So we added a couple more years of data. In 2018, 295 gallons per tap. 2019, 293 gallons per tap. What we see is an approximately 10% increase in yields per tap just in the past five years. And yet, according to CNBC, 
Maple syrup production is being devastated by global warming. By the way, this USDA data, the, U the CNBC article is specific to New York. So I got the, the USDA data for New York. MSNBC is either tragically and laughably incompetent or they are lying through their teeth. I think it's the latter. We're seeing record production nearly every year in maple syrup production. And they tell us we're facing a climate crisis for maple syrup. By the way, it's not just New York. If I'd pulled another article about maple syrup production, and there's so many out there, here we have from Statista maple syrup production going back over the past 10 years. What do you see? You see the same thing. You see lesser production 10 years ago, more production today. There is a consistent increase in maple syrup yields per tap. That's throughout the United States, not just in New York. So when you see these articles in the, in the news, whether it's coffee, maple syrup, chocolate, wine, beer, they're all out there. They all have the same result. Time doesn't permit me to hit all of them, but you can take a look at a few of the sampling here. Again, maple syrup production, it's not a crisis. It's setting new records consistently. Long-term increase, short-term increase, maple syrup production is not a crisis. All right, let's get away from specific products. I want to talk about a couple other items that are frequently in the news and have been in the news for quite some time. The Great Lakes, back in 2012, we were inundated with media reports about global warming was causing a decline in the amount of water in the Great Lakes. So here's a National Geographic article. This is from November 27th, 2012. The title is Warming Lakes, Climate Change and Variability Drive Low Water Levels on the Great Lakes. The article chronicled, in their view, all of these tragic results of lower water levels on the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes, Great Lakes need a lot of water. And it's global warming that's causing a decline in water levels. And this has terrible consequences. Well, let's go take a look at some data. Here we have, these are the actual uh, the, the water levels that were compiled by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This chart itself was produced on Dr. Roy Spencer's website, taking that NOAA chart and the NOAA data. And what you see, not quite at the far right, because this chart uh, was produced in 2019, so seven years earlier, what you see is that yes for Lake Superior and yes for lakes here on in Michigan, water levels were low. They weren't at record low levels, but they were low. Lake Erie wasn't. Lake Ontario wasn't. Based on a couple of the Great Lakes being low, you have this alarmist story from National Geographic. And yet, now look what's happened since then. Lake Superior, Huron, Michigan, Erie, Ontario are all filled with more water than usual. As a whole, they have been at record high water levels. We now have an abundance of water. If global warming causes lower water levels, then why do we have record, record high water levels? So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that the media now has apologized, given corrections, taken global warming off the hook? Of course not. So here now we have, this is an article, this is from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and this was parroted in the news media throughout the world. This is from 20, uh, September 20th, 2019. Here's the title. Researchers think they know what's causing record water levels on and flooding around the Great Lakes. Climate change. So global warming causes record low water levels. Global warming causes more water levels. Climate change is to blame. Low water is terrible. High water is better. Oh, no, no, we were wrong. High water is terrible. Lower water is better. You can't believe what you hear in the media and from climate alarmists. And notice that if you were to look at these articles, they don't present any data. They don't present any facts. They, protect an they present anecdotes and some surface observations and then blame global warming. Global warming doesn't cause Great Lakes levels to rise and fall. It can only do one or the other, or neither. Can't do both. But the media tells us both. And again, uh, the, the media articles continue. That last one was from the Union of Concerned Scientists. This is from Pew Charitable Trusts. Rising waters threaten Great Lakes communities. So now it's so terrible to have more water in the Great Lakes. Again, rising lake levels have caused significant damage throughout the Great Lakes, and experts say climate change is rapidly altering the shoreline. Can't be causing them to both rise and fall and rise again. All right, Lake Tahoe, here's another one. Uh, here is an article from the Los Angeles Times. This was taken uh, just about, I believe, a month ago, October 17th, 2021, so about two weeks ago. The title is Lake Tahoe Waters Plummet 
as drought, climate change, plague resort. So if you have lower water levels, then according to the Los Angeles Times, that's proof of climate change. Climate change causes lower water levels in Lake Tahoe. Let's look at the actual data. Here we have from the U.S. Geological Survey, the chart on the left, uh, which I uh, uh, cut and saved onto my computer just last year, chronicles Lake Tahoe water levels. When you look at the right portion of that left-hand chart, you'll see three peaks near the right-hand side. Those are peaks at the nine-foot gauge level. And what that means is that when it gets to that high, officials have to, government officials have to actually release water, excess water into the Truckee level, into the Truckee River, to keep the great, to keep uh, Lake Tahoe from flooding the shoreline. Three years out of four, they had to do so because water levels were so high because there was such an abundance of water in Lake Tahoe. Now, if you look at the right-hand chart, this is the great, uh, excuse me, I keep saying Great Lakes because of the last, uh, the last uh, topic here. But on Lake Tahoe, you see, okay, you see finally, you see a decline in water levels. It's not down to a record low. And by the way, that's going to rise pretty quickly because of last week's precipitation in, in California. But nevertheless, we have going back to 2017, we have water levels that have completely filled Lake Tahoe. When just once you have a period where that isn't achieved, you have the Los Angeles Times blaming climate change. Climate change causes drought and low Lake Tahoe water levels. Did, did climate change cause the abundance of water the last three years? They don't say so. But you know the truth. You can't blame climate change for a final, finally when you have a temporary dec decline in Lake Tahoe water levels. All right, what I presented here is just a, a sampling of topics that we at the Heartland Institute have put together in a website, climateataglance.com. We launched this website early last year and for a variety of topics that the media and climate activists frequently present, whether it's hurricanes, tornadoes, droughts, floods, the Great Barrier Reef, which I talked about in Las Vegas, or whether it's the topics I presented today, and there are many more. We put 30 of them together in this printed book, Climate at a Glance for Teachers and Students. And although our website is climateataglance.com, the reason why we call this book Climate at a Glance for Teachers and Students is we intend to mail this book to every high school science teacher in the country. We intend to send this book across the board to teachers and students. I have a copy of this book right here. You see a copy on screen, and if the camera will show me as I'm talking, I'm holding this up, but if not, you see the, you see the image on the PowerPoint. We need your help to do this. It's cost us about, it costs us about $5 per book to print this and mail this to a teacher somewhere in the United States. If it, we're going to mail it to 100 teachers, it's going to cost us $500. I'm confident that we can raise that money. I'm confident that you in the audience uh, who are concerned about getting the truth to students who are being inundated by one-sided propaganda in the schools will help pitch in for this please help out at the Heartland Institute website, heartland.org. You can go right there and there's a button to donate. For every $5 that you send us, we can send a copy to a teacher that can then present this information to students. And hopefully, for teachers that are open-minded, hopefully there are still many that exist, we'll change their minds. And every time that we change a teacher's mind, we're going to have the real truth presented to students around the country. This slide here shows a sample of what is on our Climate at a Glance website and also in our book. The way we present this is we have a few bullet points, so it's very concise. In just a minute or so, you can understand what the truth is, what the key points are on a particular topic. This one is U.S. temperatures, the U.S. temperature record. Are we setting these record temperatures every year? A few bullet points tell you the truth. Then a short discussion in which we discuss the topic a little more in depth with some citations and references to the data. And finally, we present one, sometimes two, compelling graphs that a quick glance will tell you what you need to know. So in this graph here, what you see is a temperature history of the United States going back to 2004 when the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration implemented its most accurate temperature station network, the Climate Reference Network, the most accurate one that they've ever put into place. That became operational in 2004. Highly credible data that doesn't need to be altered by government gatekeepers. And what we see is there's been no increase in U.S. temperatures now for more than 15 years. 
when folks say that I can go out into Michigan or Colorado or Seattle and I can see the difference, media will say you can see the difference that climate change is causing. No, you can't <laughs> because temperatures haven't changed. They've stayed the same for more than 15 years. Folks, this is our way to reach out not only to the media, not only to people across the country, but especially to teachers and students, to young people. So help us out in this regard and we'll make sure that every teacher in the country gets a copy of Climate at a Glance for Teachers and Students.